Another code red flood warning issued in central China as torrential rains continue drenching the area, locals facing danger. A nearly 90-year-old village woman is killed in forced demolition in China. She was beaten and shoved to the ground by demolition officers while they were destroying her home. India to confront China in a number of ways after a deadly scuffle at the border between the two countries led to the death of 20 Indian soldiers. A top Chinese diplomat in Australia is now under investigation. This after a college student filed a formal complaint against him, saying actions by the Council General put his life in danger. And China's coffee chain Luckin announced it'll officially stop trading Monday. This after the U.S. stock exchange said it would be delisted following an accounting scandal. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Another code red flood warning has been issued in central China, this time for a city about 25 miles away from the famous Three Gorges Dam. Heavy rains are drenching the area this weekend. Torrential downpours hit Yichang City inside Hubei province on Saturday morning. Within three hours, over five inches of water soaked the area. It's the heaviest rainfall on local record in the last 20 years, and many local roads are now underwater. Video shows a motorcycle rider struggling to ride against the current. The bike was soon washed away. Fortunately, its rider was not. A car also succumbed to a similar fate. Another clip shows the fast rising water level came close to submerging yet another car, this time with people inside. Others quickly rushed to the rescue. A manhole cover on the street isn't in its usual place. A man is walking by and falls into the hole. We don't know what happened next. According to local media reports, the water level behind a Three Gorges Dam had already reached critical levels last week. At the time, it had risen to six feet above its flood warning point. Speculation is now rising that the dam was leaking water downstream. But local media outlets so far haven't reported on it. A nearly 90-year-old woman died after being beaten by local officials as they were about to demolish her home. Forced evictions are common in China. Chinese citizens who resist or protest the evictions may be subjected to harassment, beatings, or in this case, death. Pan Shoujian was almost in her 90s and living in the rural area of a southern Chinese province. She was beaten and pushed to the ground by demolition officers as they broke into her family home in Liuzhou City. Two of the officers took her to a local health center. She was later transferred to a hospital where she passed away. As Pan was taken to the hospital, her family reported the incident to the police. While giving their statements in the police station, they received a call to say that Pan had died. Pan's family immediately rushed to the hospital. The town's mayor and other local officials were also in the hospital. They promised Pan's family no one would touch Pan's body and asked the family members to go back to the police station. But soon afterward, a large number of police officers surrounded the hospital. They took Pan's body to a funeral home and hurriedly cremated the body without the family's permission. The family had wanted to bury the body according to local custom. Pan's niece speaks with our reporter. They diverted us away, deliberately deceiving us. We have nowhere to turn to and no one to help us get justice. It's really hard for us. Pan's family reveals that the authorities sought out their relatives to persuade the family to take a private settlement. Pan's son refused. Wei says he wants to find out who's responsible. He wants justice for his mother. He wants to ferret out the culprit and let his mother rest in peace. Pan left behind a 90-year-old husband who is devastated by the sudden loss. And Pan's niece is still in shock. I accompany my auntie and her husband to lunch almost every day, and she just brought us some food the night before. I did not expect to lose her for forever the next day. I didn't even get to see her one last time. The whole family is grieving, and they are desperately seeking justice. If they hadn't forced the demolition yesterday, my auntie would not have died. She was in good health. Wei reveals that local authorities and property developers are demolishing housing in her village to resell for greater profit. More than 100 families in the village have lost their only home and their land. 
They have to live in tents and makeshift shelters they've erected from the debris. Who gives them the right to mess with our house? In one fell swoop, they forcibly demolished over a hundred homes in our village in a few months. We villagers are displaced. However, the shelters have also been cut off from water and electricity, and more than 200 villagers are barely surviving. How can we survive when every inch of our land is being robbed, and now we have none left? Due to the interplay between law and party politics in China, Pan's family had nowhere to turn to redress their grievances. Now they desperately turn to publicity to expose the incident. Under the communist regime in China, all land is owned by the state, which grants land rights for a set number of years. When Chinese citizens buy a home, they only own the building. Over the years, millions of Chinese have lost their homes through forced demolitions when local governments decided to reclaim the land for more profitable use. A top Chinese diplomat in Australia is now under investigation. Xu Jie serves as the Council General in Brisbane. The Queensland Police launched the investigation after a formal complaint by Drew Pavlo, an undergrad at the University of Queensland. He alleges that Xu released a statement last year calling him a separatist and put his life in danger. In China, that label is a capital crime and is punishable by death. Last year, Pavlo was accused of being anti-China. That's after he organized a pro-democracy event to protest the Communist Party's anti-democratic actions in Hong Kong, as well as the persecution of Uyghur Muslims and the university's close ties to the regime. China state-run Global Times later published his name, followed by a statement from the Council General. Both called him out as a separatist. Pavlo explained how he began receiving death threats, both against him and his family, after Xu's statement was released. But the Chinese embassy defended the council general's statement, calling it appropriate and measured. Pavlo's complaint is now calling for an unreserved apology from the council general, including a retraction of the statement. A spokesman for the Queensland Police has confirmed to media outlet News Australia the investigation has been launched. Pavlo is also currently embroiled in a disciplinary action debate with the University of Queensland, which denies it has anything to do with the Chinese regime. Chinese tech giant Huawei has been given the green light to build a new UK research facility. The telecoms company received approval on Thursday for a $1 billion facility in Cambridge, England. The consent comes despite the company recently coming under fire for security concerns posed by many world powers, including the UK. According to Huawei's press release, the nine-acre facility will serve as its international headquarters and create around 400 jobs. The U.S. has repeatedly criticized the tech company, alleging close ties to China's communist regime. The Pentagon recently labeled 20 top Chinese firms operating in the U.S. as having ties to the regime's military. Huawei was included on the list. Former U.K. Prime Minister Tony Blair says the U.K. should side with the U.S. on the Huawei issue. U.S. federal agents have seized nearly $130,000 worth of assault weapons parts from China. A smuggler tried to ship the parts through UPS to the United States from Shenzhen, China. Federal officers confiscated the shipment when they examined the package in the Louisville, Kentucky UPS hub. It was described as containing steel pin samples and was headed to a private residence in Florida. Chinese coffee chain Lucking says it will officially stop trading next Monday. The Nasdaq stock market told the company this May that its stock will be delisted following a counting scandal. Once a hot startup and rival of Starbucks, Luckin disclosed this April that almost half of its sales last year were fabricated. A month later, Nasdaq notified the company that it will be delisted. Luckin initially requested a hearing before the panel, but later canceled it and said this Friday that it no longer plans to appeal Nasdaq's decision. The company's board of directors has proposed to remove its director. The killing of 20 Indian soldiers in a border clash with China is a turning point in the two countries' relationship. An Indian geopolitical journalist says that India will confront China from multiple aspects.
According to Epoch Times reporter Venus Upadhyaya, it's no longer the case that India believes it can walk the fine line between managing its territorial and ideological clashes with the Chinese regime and trade economically with the regime. Upadhyaya specializes in Indian and South Asian geopolitics. So there was a slogan in India which was called Bhartiya Chini Bhai Bhai, which means that Indian and Chinese are brothers. Bye bye. Bye bye. But now after the re recent Galwan incident where 20 Indian soldiers lost their lives, the campaign that's happening against China and India, many people are saying that, uh, you know, Bhartiya Chini Bhai Bhai, which means like, okay, now it's a bye bye to our relationship. She said the Indian society is clear that this border clash is not a simple accident by the regime's People's Liberation Army, or PLA. That's why the reactions will be strong. At every level of the PLA, there is a parallel hierarchy which exists in the Communist Party. So any decision by the PLA is not an independent decision. And a decision which is between, like, which impacts relationships of two countries where 20 soldiers die, it cannot just happen randomly. You know, it's not a random thing that they've just gone and killed 20 Indian soldiers with, like, such primitive weapons. So obviously there is something that is coming from behind from the Chinese regime, and Indians are very aware of it. That's why there's going to be a major backlash as what the experts are telling, and there's going to be a change in the import policy, in Indian foreign policy. Probably there's going to be a big buildup on the border. Saying goodbye is not an easy thing for India and China. China is India's biggest trading partner. Bilateral trade between the two amounts to $93 billion. But now for India, confronting China may no longer be a question of whether or not, but when and how. And there is a very big anti-China sentiment within the Indian business community. And after the killing of these 20 soldiers, now it's become an issue of national pride. So therefore, it's also going to be an issue which will be a major issue in the Indian elections, whether it's at the federal level or at the state level. So even the Indian politicians, you know, they would not be able to, even if they want to support the Chinese regime, they cannot openly support the Chinese regime. Because it's become, a, Indians have become very emotional about it. As India gains a larger profile on the international stage, including a seat on the United Nations Security Council and being the chair of the World Health Organization's executive board, the country might use these levers against China. Experts tell me that it's going to take at least two generations for Chinese regime to get any kind of a positive response from India on the international arena. They say that the most sensitive thing that the Chinese regime, the, the Chinese regime is very sensitive about its image on the international platforms. So they say the, the best thing India can do is to not support that. And that's the way India is going to counter uh, the Chinese regime on the international arenas. She said experts expect that India may do so by breaking its long-time silence in condemning China's human rights violations. It may also increase political and economic interactions with Taiwan. Both are hot-button issues for the Chinese Communist Party. Reporting by Penny Joe, NTD News. Once an emperor's prized possession, a masterpiece porcelain was recently rediscovered in an elderly woman's cupboard. The 18th century Harry Garner reticulated vase is named after one of its former collectors and was passed down in the family for 60 years before resurfacing. It was originally a gift for Emperor Qianlong, who kept it in the Palace of Heavenly Purity as a prized artifact. The reason it's so valuable is this is the ultimate trophy piece reflecting the greatness of China at the peak of its power and prosperity, an exceedingly complex, technically brilliant porcelain vase. The blue and white vase references iconic 15th century Ming-style porcelain production. A wall of celadon interlocking dragons encases it, a decoration taken from the highly regarded bronzes of the 10th century BC. And above that is a floral ruby ground design in European Rococo style. According to Sotheby's Asia, this kind of vase is very difficult to produce. It is expected to be sold for between 9 and 11.6 million U.S. dollars at a Hong Kong auction in July. Almost $7 billion will now help battle the virus spread. It comes from a host of governments around the world, many of whom said they want to see a vaccine available for all. And Buenos Aires had to tighten its lockdown rules again as virus cases went up in recent weeks.
A global fundraising meeting this week raised almost $7 billion from the United States, the European Commission, and numerous countries to fight the virus spread. Many participants stressed that if a vaccine was developed, it should be available to anyone who needs it. The biggest pledge came from the European Commission, worth over $5 billion. Argentina will tighten a lockdown in and around Buenos Aires. The decision follows a sharp rise in cases in recent weeks. Argentina's president said restrictions on movement in Buenos Aires that had previously eased would be tightened again next week due to the rise in infections. Overall, cases in the country have risen fivefold since late May, hitting over 50,000 this week. India reported over 17,000 new virus cases over the last 24 hours, pushing the country's total to over half a million. New Delhi is among the worst hit cities, with more than 40,000 cases detected in the last two weeks. Infections are expected to continue rising steadily in India. A study conducted by a professor at the University of Michigan forecasts that India could see almost a million cases by July 15th. Madrid City Hall lit up the skies with drones this week as a tribute for virus victims and for those who have fought the virus in Spain. Forty programmed drones with multicolored LED lights shone over Madrid, creating different forms. The location of the performance remained a secret until it took place to avoid crowds and large gatherings. The nation's trucking industry has hit a snag with the economic damage brought about by the virus pandemic. But experts are saying not only is the industry striving, it has also changed for the better. In the U.S., the commercial transportation industry has felt the heavy impact of the pandemic. The decrease in foreign imports as well as the drop in consumer spending have hurt shipping lines. Demand for medium to heavy duty trucks is dropping by 40 percent. And as the economy recovers, only a certain percentage of those who were laid off will be returning to work. But CEO of IRC Freight Solutions Spencer Smith isn't faced by this temporary fallout. He's focusing on long term effects like market shifts. Rather than, you know, a, a, a decrease in the market or an increase in the market, we're going to see a lot of changes in the market. So we're going to see a lot of changes in, in shipping lanes and the way that uh, supply chains are being run and thusly the way that the trucking is, uh, is moving those supplies from point. And according to Smith, the need to avoid a second virus outbreak has actually prompted a technological boost as well. They're starting to use technology finally, which is honestly what they should have done years ago. Robotics and autonomous technology are now being used in warehouses and fulfillment centers across the U.S. Smith says it's making the trucking industry more efficient. So it's actually in some cases these workflows have actually improved the efficiency in these shippers, which is, again, much needed. Smith says the recent push toward manufacturing more goods domestically will lead to a decrease in freight shipments entering ports and a change in shipping lanes. Pubs in England have the go-ahead to open their doors again on July 4th, more than three months after they were ordered to shut down. But with new restrictions, the typical pub experience might be a little different. Our UK correspondent Jane Wirrell has more. We're still not entirely sure that we will open on the 4th of July because of the location of where we are. The main customers for pubs in this area in central London are office workers and tourists, often from the nearby British Museum. But with many people working from home and fewer travellers expected, British pub owners in this location are facing some changes. We're having to make different decisions based on outside pressures, which can be very positive. And I think we're quite excited about making those decisions. The business has been delivering throughout the lockdown, and now they are shifting their focus more towards local produce, like making mead from local honey. To coincide with reopenings, the UK is easing its social distancing rules. Where it is possible to keep two metres apart, people should. But where it is not, we will advise people to keep a social distance of one metre plus. New guidance means customers will notice a few other differences when going to the pub. Customers' contact details will be temporarily recorded for 21 days to trace infections and there will be no more ordering a pint of beer at the bar. They're not going to be able to get up and walk to the bar like we've traditionally done. How central are pubs to British communities? British people love to go down the pub, have a good chat, have a good discussion, have a good debate and, and put the world to right. So it's really been missed by the British people. Expecting a potential demand from office workers wanting to socialise once they're back, the Crown owners want to find ways to bring the pub experience to their customers.
you know, we do master classes on cocktails or, or how to produce your own gin, bits and pieces like that. Can we take that to their offices so that they get the pub experience somewhere else? And we're hoping the answer to that is yes, because that's part of our plan. While this pub won't reopen on July the 4th, the owners say they are working hard to welcome customers at a slightly later date. Jane Worrell, NTD News, London. After months of staying inside, families are getting some fresh air. They're camping out at a family-owned site in a small Tennessee town. Farmland stretched for miles and it's a serene place to escape to. Traffic lights are miles apart in this Tennessee town where birds chirping rings out. And the air is pure. Down these long country roads, it's a place where people can forget their worries and stress, even if by accident. We were supposed to be in Italy and coronavirus happened. So we decided to come out here and visit my sister and the city she lives in doesn't have any hotels. So. She said her experience was a unique one. It's a spot to escape society for a while with a trek through the woods or exploring the wide open space, like the tranquil acres of nearby farms. Later, visitors can spend the evenings unwinding in a yurt or visiting with the roosters. Some call it glamorized camping, with beds, bathrooms, a kitchen, and Wi-Fi. I love the hustle and bustle of the city, but to get away to a place like this, it's nice to get away and just have some peace and quiet for a little while. The site is family owned and operated and was started by locals Desiree and Corey in 2017. But getting the business going wasn't smooth sailing. But, you know, just, it was just building it because it was me and my wife uh, for the most part. We did everything. I mean, we built the decks, we, we uh, did the electrical work, the plumbing work. The building. They were inspired by visiting other family-owned camping sites over the years. They wanted to pull all kinds of different cultures and atmospheres together to create their own secluded retreat. Like lifelong connections, that's what I hope people take away from here. Even if it's with us or just the place or with others they've met here. I, that's, that's our ultimate goal, is to give them something or an experience they don't forget. They were forced to close down when the pandemic hit and feared that their business might go under. But with restrictions easing up, business is booming as people are eager to get back outdoors after months of staying inside. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Starting today, we'll also be answering some questions from our viewers. One question came in from Independent Scan Cutter, who says the world needs to take action against China for their global crimes against humanity. How can we make the world leaders take action? Our China and Focus team hopes that through our news reports, more people can learn about what the Chinese Communist Party has been doing and is doing since so much has been covered up. We believe that when people are truly informed, they have the chance to make better decisions, and that includes world leaders. So we hope our audience will help share our videos with their family and friends and others so they can better understand what's really going on. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to like and subscribe for the latest updates and see you next time.